The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everybody, welcome to uh, unit number five in the Lunch and Learn series. Um, just want to make sure I'm being heard. Could I just get you to type in the word clear in the question box there? Just to let me know that, uh, yeah, thanks Marco. Welcome again, as usual. Thank you. Thanks John, welcome. Thanks Colleen. Thanks Melissa. Okay, all good. Sounds like everybody's coming through loud and clear. Great. Well, we're getting towards the end of the Lunch and Learn series. I've really enjoyed working with you. Obviously, we've still got another session after today. Um, but look, I hope you've had a chance to apply what you've learned. It's, it's one thing to, to enjoy them and uh, enjoy these sessions or even to be entertained by them. But I think at the end of the day, it's all about what you do in the fortnight between the sessions that really counts. So I hope you've actually had a chance to apply some of those key learnings. So we've got a fun topic today, understanding people and their personalities, but we've all, it's a fun topic, but it's a serious topic. In other words, we've all had personality clashes with people and will continue to do throughout our career and our lives. And it's always, so it's always a difficult sort of proposition when we have a clash with someone and it's often because we don't understand where they're coming from. So I'm hoping that this might help today, give some sense making to the whole notion of how we might deal with other people more effectively. Now there was a diagnostic or a questionnaire to complete and if you haven't done that, that's okay. If you have, well of course, uh, you could use this as a bit of a debrief to help you with that. All right, so let's launch into our topic. Um, as you can see, on your screen, uh, should be coming up very soon, there we go. You can see the eight, the six units that we, we are covering and we're up to number, number five. And last time we got together, of course, two weeks ago, we were looking at uh, getting the very best from other people. So I hope you've had a chance to apply some of that learning. And what I really wanted you to do uh, you know, two weeks ago is to start to use autonomy, mastery and purpose in your leadership decisions and conversations. And this was the work of Daniel Pink who, argue, who argues that when we're dealing with knowledge workers or people with a, a fairly high level of education relative to others, then we need to give them three things. We need to give them autonomy, that is, give them some freedom about the decisions and the choices that they make. Certainly micromanagement would be, would be the opposite of that. We need to give people a sense of mastery or at least sponsor their opportunity to master the work they're doing now and in the future. And we also need to give people a why of work, you know, what Stephen's, uh, Simon Sinek talks about as the why of work. So why are we doing what we're doing and what's the contribution this makes to the overall work that people do? So I think if you do those three things, then what you do is you create a really good situation um, in terms of being able to get the best from other people. So hopefully you've had a chance to do that and, uh, and you've got some good results out of it. And I'd be always interested to hear about any feedback that you've got in relation to that. So today we're going to look at four things. We're going to look at personality as a concept. We're going to look at understanding personality traits. So we'll look at the four personality styles or types as Carl Jung might have called it a century ago. We'll look at the application in other words, how might you treat each of these personalities? And we'll look at the co concept of the platinum rule, which I'm sure you've heard of, rather than the golden rule. So we'll look at, those, look at that to sum up at the end. All right, so let's just talk about personality for a moment. And so really the purpose of today is to provide you with a fun tool that's quite practical for understanding yourself and others. Now, personality, the word personality, comes from the Greek word persona. And persona means mask. So essentially what it means is that all of us wear a mask. 
and that mask, where it comes from, is highly debatable. So psychologists for many, many years have been arguing about where personality comes from, whether it's a, a genetic predisposition, whether it's an environmental condition, whether it's a combination of both. Can you change people's personality or are they fairly fixed? All of these questions have fascinated psychologists for many, many years. And we've come to know great conclusions about these things. And I'm not sure there are necessarily great conclusions, but there has been some waves of thinking around personality, which is interesting. So Carl Jung, the very famous psychologist, uh, had the first was the very first psychologist who developed a theory of personality types. So he developed a theory that argued that people could be, in some respects, typecast. So we could actually see certain personality traits in certain types of personalities. Now, that theory was highly controversial in its day. In fact, in many cases, it still is. And people railed against Carl Jung and said, you can't really categorize people and, you know, and pretty much uh, thought the theory was a whole lot of nonsense. But clearly it's been a very, very powerful theory because there's a whole industry that's developed around this theory. Many of you have done um, Meyer Briggs type personality indicators. Many of you have done DISC. There are so many different personality assessment tools out there in the marketplace now that it's obvious that Carl Jung has had enormous influence over people's, uh, over this whole industry about personality testing and profiling. So there must be some face validity to what Carl Jung talked about. And then the concept was, is it environmental or is it, or is it something genetic? So the pendulum has swung. In the early days, it was considered to be very much environment, that you are a product of your environment. And uh, many people actually made uh, the assumption that people's personality had been formed by the age of seven. So the, 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 the main structures of those personalities and had been formed by the environment or their upbringing and where they'd come from. And then, of course, there was a movement of people who thought or think and still do that personality is a genetic predisposition so that we're born with a personality and it's part of our genetic makeup, not necessarily hereditary, of course, but partly genetics. And I suppose when you think about it, if you have young children or have had young children, you could see that their personalities are very much formed from a very young age. In other words, you know, the the ones that are very quiet tend to be quiet and the ones that are very loud tend to be loud. And you've got ones that are organized and ones that are not. So it adds an interesting layer to it. And the latest sort of research into personality comes from the neuroplasticity movement. And this movement is basically saying that, uh, well, that it was based on a very, very famous research. So what they did is they got a group of people together and this group of people uh, were basically taught uh, meditation techniques for six weeks and they had to meditate once a day for six weeks. So they took a brain scan before and then they put them through this process of meditating for six weeks. And then, of course, they took another brain scan uh, after six weeks. So this is just 20 minutes a day for six weeks. And then they took a brain scan. And then they had a control group who didn't do the meditation, who they scanned the brain. And then, of course, they scanned the brain again in six weeks time. And what they found from the study was that the people who had been exposed to meditation were actually uh, their brain had actually changed shape as a result of their experience with meditation, albeit only 20 minutes a day. And so the argument was that our personality is changing all the time. Our, sorry, our brain or the structure of our brain is changing all the time. 
So in other words, it's a bit like a muscle that if you go to the gym and exercise it, it tends to get larger. And of course, if you don't, it gets smaller. But all the while, the brain is like a muscle and it can change and flex and grow depend, depend, <clears throat> depending on the stimuli it gets. So the argument was that our brain is continually changing shape and form throughout our life and that the previous myth that we're too old to learn or, you know, these sorts of ideas are now being debunked through this research. And, of course, we've got people learning, you know, languages in their 80s and doing PhDs in their 70s and 80s. And so it's very uh, possible that, that, this, uh, that the concept of personality changing over our lifetime is a very real concept. Anyway, so enough of that. I don't have any conclusive evidence one way or the other. Nobody does. There's a whole lot of interesting theories about it, nevertheless. And if any of you have got any comments or thoughts, go for your life. But I think the important point I make here is that the reason we have a personality is to protect ourselves from the dangerous impacts and influences in the world or what we perceive to be dangerous. So in other words, when we're under stress or under pressure in any way, and let's face it, that's a fair bit of our chunk of our time in the workplace, what happens is our personality accentuates. So our personality becomes uh, stronger. That mask, if you like, that we're wearing that I talked about becomes thicker. So let's have a look at a, uh, you know, the personality profile that I sent you. Now, one of the big problems with the personality profiles that people do, I think, is that we can never quite understand from the labels what they mean. So, for example, example with MBTI, we get four letters and it doesn't really give us much indicator as to what it means on, on the surface. We have to go and find out what that means. So I decided to just put one together which pretty much uh, depicted four animals and the whole idea of that is that when you get a picture of this animal, you can kind of think, well, yeah, I, 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 got, I get it. I know what they're like. So we've got owls, we've got lambs, we've got bulls, and we've got peacocks. And so the little test that I sent you uh, had some statements which really categorised you as owls, bulls, lambs, or peacocks. And when you think about those animals, you can probably work out pretty quickly what sort of traits they have. So let's look at the model to start with, and then we'll look at the actual personality types. So it's a typical two by two matrix, and you've got there the four animal types there, the owls, the bulls at the top, the lambs and the peacocks at the bottom. Now, the first and key important uh, variable in the uh, model is the concept of introversion and extroversion. Now, um, you probably have heard a lot of things about introversion and extroversion, and unfortunately, it's been distorted somewhat, and there's a lot of nonsense that's written about these topics, and much of which is very misleading and, and wrong. Ultimately, all it means is that introverts have a tendency to recharge their batteries, re-energise themselves, in other words, by being on their own. So they will tend to gravitate to singular, you know, to be on their own, basically, in private. Whereas extroverts have a tendency to recharge their batteries by being with and around other people. Now, you might say to me, well, I'm a bit of both. It depends on how I'm feeling or all the rest of it. Well, that's true. Um, if you have a look at, if you look at, you, if you have done this uh, profile, if you add your owl and your lamb scores together, that's the total scores, and you add your bull and your peacock scores, you can see very quickly whether you're more prone to being introvert or extrovert. And so, um, you know, if you're more extrovert than introvert, then, you know, being on your own to recharge your batteries will make a lot of sense to you and vice versa, talking things out with people can be a form of therapy and, uh, you know, uh, energy building. It has absolutely nothing to do with ability to deal with people. It has nothing to do with emotional intelligence. It has nothing to do with leadership. 
And I think this is very, very important because a lot of people make the assumption that to be a good leader, you have to be an extrovert. Or if you're good with people, you can't possibly be an introvert. This is where the misleading nonsense is in play. All right, so that's the first dimension. Now, the other dimension that's important in this is you've got the task and the people dimension. So in the workplace, of course, there are a whole string of tasks that have to be done. They have to be done because that's the nature of the business. But also, of course, they're usually done with and through other people. So in other words, we're dealing with people in order to get the tasks done. So we found that most people have a predisposition or a favorite a favoritism towards a task or the people initially. Most of us at one intellectual level understand that we've got to do tasks and we've got to deal with people. But if given a choice, we often will have a tendency to be one or the other. So if you look, if you did complete your profile, if you add up your owl and your bull scores and you add up your lamb and your peacock scores, you'll kind of get an indication of whether you're more task focused or more people focused. And what this means in practice mean, is simply this, that owls and bulls will have a tendency to want to get straight into the task first and then build the relationships up as a consequence of doing something. Whereas the lamb and the peacocks will have a tendency to want to build a rapport and build an understanding and connection with the people they're going to work with in order to produce a better result. So it's really about, you know, what comes first. So they're the two dimensions. So it's a very simple model. And obviously in the model itself, you've got owls who are obviously introverted and task focused. You've got bulls who are extroverted and task focused. You've got lambs who are introverted and people focused, and you've got peacocks who are extroverted and people focused. And so this gives us our four personality types that Jung had talked about many, many, uh, many years ago. So what I'm going to do now is I just want to spend a bit of time talking about each of these personality types. And then uh, what I want to do then is give you some heads up or some tips on how you might actually deal with that personality type in a better way. So you can have some fun with this and because I've been doing this work for many, many years and thoroughly enjoy it, it is very easy for me to be able to cor make correct assumptions about people early on in our working relationship and therefore be able to build rapport faster because I know what they're after and I know what I can offer. It's not about manipulation. It's about actually getting on the right page with them early on and not and trying to mitigate any potential for a conflict in preferences and style and approach and all those sorts of things. So that's the benefit out of it for you, too. So if we look at the peacock as the first example, and I'll use this in order because this is the order it came up in the survey. So if you look at peacocks, peacocks have a tendency, their primary motivation is being popular. Now, this is an extreme, and I'm not suggesting that all peacocks are striving all the time to be popular. But at the end of the day, being reasonably popular is important, generally speaking, to the peacock. Although it's an ideal because there's no way that we can please everybody all the time. So therefore, it's, none of these primary motivations of any of the personalities are real. But what happens is the personality aspires to it as a way of protecting itself from the rest of the world. So being popular. So if you think about that from another point of view, the characteristics of the peacock is that there's a tendency for them to be extroverted. There's a tendency for them to be talkers and to be optimistic. So the glass is half full, not half empty for the peacock. So full of energy, life of the party, that kind of person. I think you would know if you came across a peacock, they've usually got quite a, a loud voice. Uh, they're quite outgoing. They tend to be laughing and smiling a lot. 
so in your workplace, I'm sure if you're not one, I'm sure you can pick up on an example of somebody who may exhibit the traits of a peacock. So their great strengths are that they normally have a very appealing personality, so they're fun to be around. They make you laugh, they make you smile, they're just a lot of fun to be with. Their tendency is to be quite creative and colourful, and usually there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm, so that sort of gives you a bit of an idea. And normally the peacock can be quite inspirational because they tend to want to work with people and be quite optimistic. Now, if we look at some famous personalities that might fit the bill, I've picked a couple here that might uh, might help. So you've got Paris Hilton, who really probably has been a bit off the radar in the last few years, but uh, Paris Hilton is definitely a peacock. Um, she, you might recall, went to prison for tax evasion, uh, I think it was, uh, many years ago, I mean, I don't think she spent long time in prison, but she t she decided to turn it into a uh, publicity stunt. And, um, you know, so only a peacock would do that. I mean, most people would just quietly do their time and uh, sort of get out of there as quickly as possible in the most dignified way, but not the peacock necessarily. And, of course, the great Scottish comedian who... Uh, who uh, Sir Billy Connolly is uh, is definitely one is definitely a peacock. I mean, he will go on the stage, and I've gone to see him uh, present, and he'll go on the stage, and one thing will lead to another. One tangent will go this way, and one tangent will go that way, and before you know it, you're off, you know, um, on some destination, and he probably doesn't even know that that destination was where he wanted to go. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you could probably recognise what I meant by that. So their motto in life, that is the peacock, is that their, any publicity is good publicity. So they, you know, as long as people are talking about me, it doesn't matter what it is that they're saying. Uh, and that's probably going to an extreme. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the classic uh, Hollywood movie star would be a peacock. You know, they're naturally... Um, wanting to be spoken about in the gossip columns and all the rest of it. And so that's that personality. Now, the second personality is the bull. So the bull personality, their motto in life is uh, being powerful. Now, uh, bulls are not always in control, but the great fear that the bull has as a personality type is being taken advantage of by other people. So they do everything they can not to be taken advantage of. And in, and if you think about it, the way to best not be taken advantage of is to actually be in a leadership position or to preempt any advantage that someone might take uh, to get on top of them. So it's, un, it's not unusual for the bulls to be quite forthright and assertive and... Uh, and to gravitate to leadership positions and responsibility as a result of that. So their characteristics are extrovert. So they, there is a great tendency to, you know, um, you know, to be engaged with other people. They tend to be doers, and by doers, what I mean is that they're always, uh, you know, got so many things on the go at once. They very rarely will sit down and do nothing, and they're always doing things, and they're always tinkering with different... So they have about 20 balls in the air focused at once, and they tend to be optimistic, so they usually will see the glass as half full, so very much love challenges. I think that would be a good way of putting it. So these characteristics are very... Um, again, would be fairly obvious if you saw them in someone... There's a tendency for them to be born leaders, and by born leaders, I'm not referring to them as meaning that they make the best leaders. Not necessarily the case, actually. But by born leaders, what I really mean there is that these people are the most comfortable of the four personalities in a leadership role. That's what I mean by that. And there's a tendency that they're very goal-oriented. 
So what it means is that they want to know what the bottom line is or the big picture. So they're very good at distilling down all the nonsense and the rubbish and getting to the main point, sorting the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. So they move, they move quickly into action as a personality type. And uh, two personalities that I can think of that fit this bill uh, is uh, Madonna, the um, you know the musician who's still apparently knocking out songs, and for a lot of her career, she actually managed her career. So she basically did a lot of that herself, rather than what a lot of people do is find a good manager and they look after their own business affairs. She did she did she did and does a lot of that herself. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, ran for president in 2016 against uh, the current president, Donald Trump, and it's fairly clear that she wanted things done her way. And so, you know, reading a couple of the books about her campaign, um, she wanted it all done pretty much the way she wanted it done because of her strong bull personality. And the motto, of course, of the bull is that I'm in control and I'm willing to lead. Um, and, and so that's the sort of motto. Now, in the workplace, these people are often the ones who uh, will take on extra responsibility, do enjoy challenges, uh, do have strong opinions, aren't afraid or shy of expressing those opinions, and will often do so even when they're not asked to do so. And so uh, for a leader, uh, there is a certain way to get the best out of the bull, which I'll talk about shortly. I'm sure you can think of some people like that. But I think the important point is that just because you're a bull doesn't make you an, a natural leader. It's just that you might feel more comfortable in the leadership role. So both the bull and the peacock personality are extroverts. So we're going to look at the next two uh, and they are both introverts. So let's actually have a look at the first one. The first one is the owl. Now, of the four personalities, the owl is the most sensitive of the four. So their feelings can get hurt very easily. And I'll talk about why in a moment. But their primary motivation is being perfect. So they're always striving to get things right. So because of that, they're always asking for more information we'll do a little bit more research, we'll procrastinate on decision making because they want to get it absolutely right. And so they, and of course, like I said before, this is an ideal, This it's impossible to be perfect, but the owl will strive to be perfect. So you can imagine that the problems there might be that they don't meet deadlines, they're too slow to get things done. Um, they do get sensitive when people criticise their work. So you can imagine uh, how that plays out. So the characteristics of the owl are that they are introvert. So the glass is, uh, sorry, they're introverts, so they'll tend to be more, you know, private than public. They're thinkers. In fact, many people would say they're overthinkers. They'll often think things through to an incredible degree um, and perhaps overthink and they're pessimistic. In other words, the glass is half full rather than, sorry, half empty rather than half full. And so the interesting thing about the owl is they're great at assessing risk. So it can come across as negativity, but when a owl sees, you know, an owl, because they're analysing the situation, uh, will often come to a conclusion about how something can be done better, faster or easier, or perhaps what the pitfalls of a, an approach are. When they blurt those things out, it can be conceived as negative, but in actual fact, it's worth listening to because they've obviously thought it through and they've, pick, have, have pulled the um, you know, the key points out of it, and you can get something very useful from an owl in that sense. So they love, they love schedules and they are list makers, born list makers. 
there will be a tendency for them to be to, to go about their work and their personal life in a very habitual way. They have very high standards, not only of themselves, but everybody else around the place. So whilst they'll be super critical of you, they'll also be, if not more so, super critical of themselves. And this is the thing that's often understood about the owls. They're very hard on themselves. They set themselves impossibly high standards often, and that can be an issue. They are usually very orderly and systematic and organized, and they appreciate it when other people exhibit the same traits. So they're looking for that sort of uh, systemized approach, and it's very important that there's structure that people have thought through what they're doing. So being flippant with an owl is not actually a good starting point to get them to win them over. So two people that I could identify who's fitting this mold, one of course is still alive and very much alive, and the other one is dead. Roger Federer, the great tennis player, I think he's about 38 years of age, he's still playing at the top of his game. And apparently there is no one who trains harder than Roger Federer. He is persistent and consistent with his own training. And he's a perfectionist, in other words. And because of that, he's been able to sustain a natural, uh, uh, a natural skill for a long period of time. And of course, Leonardo da Vinci during, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, the Renaissance man, as we often refer to him, and we've learned about him in school, no doubt. And you might recall those pictures of the human body, as you can see down the bottom right-hand corner. Um, he was such a perfectionist in his work that when he was about to draw these human body, uh, depict this human body the way he did, he actually, actually went into a graveyard and dug up a body and he cut it open to try and understand how the muscular system actually, you know, how it worked, because he wanted to depict it perfectly in a drawing. So that's fairly obsessive, and it's obviously, uh, you know, bordering on a perfectionist streak. Uh, so there you go, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci would definitely fit the bill as an owl. Now, their motto in life as a personality is that, how can I paint this perfect picture? They're always striving to actually contribute and do their very best. So sloppy work is not appreciated by the owl, and certainly it would be highly unlikely that the owl would produce sloppy work for you or anybody. But as a personality, it's a very difficult one to manage particularly if you're not an owl, because it's hard to understand the mindset of the owl. But uh, if you can get them on side, wonderful. But they can be enormously moody and can sulk for days, weeks, months, years, decades. And I've seen it. And it's um, because, you know, they, they have this sort of sensitive predisposition. Now let's look at the last one and then once I've done that, what I want to do is, if you've got any questions, I would be keen to hear what they are. So just type them in the question box there. Um, what I might do is we'll look at the last one and then we'll actually look at the personality traits in terms of what you can do in order to get the best from those people that you lead that might exhibit those personality traits. So let's look at the lamb. Now the primary motivation of the lamb is being peaceful. Now, again, they're not uh, being peaceful means that, you know, I mean, let's face it, two people on a desert island, there's going to be an argument at some point or a disagreement. So it, again, it's an ideal, but what the lamb attempts to do is to try to be the peacemaker and do everything they can to avoid conflict where, you know, wherever possible. So that's what they go through life, trying to avoid conflict. So that has its obvi obvious advantages and it also has some disadvantages as well. Okay, so their characteristics are their 
they are um, introverted. So there's a tendency for them to be relatively quiet and private people. They will tend to be watchers in the sense that in a meeting, for example, they'll watch everybody else interact. And once they feel comfortable, they'll jump in and interact at the right, you know, at the end, once they can see what, you know, the lie of the land, and what's appropriate and whatever. And like the owls, they are pessimists. So the glass is half empty, not half full. So there's a tendency for that to occur. Now, they don't normally wear their heart on their sleeve and they don't normally look like they're terribly excited about what they're doing. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're not. They may well be quite motivated underneath. It's just that they don't display that on, you know, the same way that perhaps a peacock would. So their strengths are that they are very competent and steady. So you give an owl, uh, sorry, you give a lamb a, a job to do, and they're very clear about the objectives. They know what's required. They've got some deadlines and resources to work with. They will tend to get it done very well. And normally they are very peaceful and agreeable. So the idea is that they're inoffensive and people, and, and they're able to build rapport with wide groups of people because they have this natural, peaceful and agreeable personality. So they're not threatening to people, if you like. And they are very good at mediating problems. So if there are two views, conflicting views in a meeting, for example, or between two individuals, the lamb is able to see both sides of it and come to some sort of a middle ground, if you like. So in that sense, that's quite useful for them. Uh, two personalities that fit the bill, and I purposely picked two actors here because, again, there's a bit of a stereotype that all actors are peacocks. Now, the movie star type actor is a peacock, but the method actors, the ones who are the perfectionists, and so forth are not necessarily that way inclined. One of my favourite actors, for example, is Keanu Reeves. Now, Keanu Reeves um, does not in any way enjoy the publicity of being in the movies. And he leads a very private life. And the only time you'll see him being interviewed is when he has signed a contract to indicate that he has to go and promote the movie by doing a number of interviews. Otherwise, you will not see him interviewed because that's not his thing. He doesn't like that. And Kirsten Stewart um, is the same. She's a great actor or actress, and she is not, you know, from the uh, very much uh, very popular with the um, teenage uh, group. Uh, she doesn't. You know, she doesn't, she's not interested in publicity either. And if she gets some publicity, she certainly didn't generate it herself. So there's two actors. And, and apparently, you know, Keanu Reeves is an absolute pleasure. Both of them are here, a pleasure to work with. So they're easy to work with on set. And because of that, you know, they're very relaxed and uh, remember people's names and certainly don't rock the boat with contro controversial uh, decisions and all the rest of it or, or opinions. So their sort of, uh, I guess, the motto is that peace is the overriding consideration. So they're always focused on trying to, to create the peace because peace is very important in terms of uh, how they like to function in the world. So folks, there's the four personality types. Now, Obviously, when you if you have filled it out, you'll notice that you didn't get 40 points in each in one column and then zero, zero, zero. So it is true to say that all of us are a combination of these four personality types. However, if you scored a higher score in one of those columns, and particularly if it was a significantly higher score, such as 20, which obviously means 50%, then it's likely that these characteristics that I talk about are very real in relation to the way you function in the world and in your own leadership style. So let's have a look at some of the things that you can do in order to um, 
improve your working relationships with the four personalities. So if we take the peacock, um, they sometimes they will promise things and forget that they promised them and won't deliver, and it can be very disappointing if you're not a peacock. So I guess what you need to do is to follow through with the peacock and let them know what their commitments were to yourself and to others as a reminder, but doing it in a, in a respectful way via email or something. You'll find that they will actually appreciate that because it keeps them on track. They actually need people to keep them on track and they don't resent that. They actually appreciate it. And this is a, often a misleading concept that people might think that the peacock actually doesn't mind being organised. They don't want to be over-organised. They certainly don't want to be micromanaged. That would be a terrible thing to do. But they don't mind the odd reminder about what's required. Um, so sometimes realise it's also important to realise that the peacock often doesn't put their brain into gear when they open their mouth. So it's quite likely that they could say something that was that is quite offensive to other people and people can interpret it as saying, well, isn't that terrible, that person, because they just said what they said. But I think the truth of the matter is often they don't think about what they say and that's why they sometimes say things that they probably regret later on. But the nice quality about the peacock is they don't dwell on it. They don't worry about, you know, uh, putting their foot in their mouth. They just get on and move on. But the important thing to realise is they're not actually, um, they're just, they're not, they're just they're, they think aloud. I think that's the point. You'll often hear the peacock say, I'm just thinking aloud. The other thing you should do is, is, of course, if possible, is to give them lots of variety and flexibility in their work. Uh, the peacocks do not respond well to repetition. And so they usually have short attention spans and do enjoy, um, you know, repetitive activity, if you like. It becomes quite important to them. So um, they do thrive on, um, on that kind of thing. Uh, another thing is, remember, they don't, don't expect them to remember appointments or, or to be on time all the time. That, that can be a source of infuriation from other people. But at the end of the day, again, it's about reminding people and sending reminders and so forth uh, because the peacocks often don't have that structured thinking that some of the other personalities have. And the other thing, of course, is they've always got a good war story to tell. And I think it's often a good idea to listen to their war stories in a, as a way of, well, one, being entertained. But secondly, so that you can, you know, hopefully get them to listen to you. And I think by doing, by listening to their stories, you'd be going some way of doing that. So obviously, um, they've always got a story or a, or a joke or something that... Uh, can often break the ice and be interesting at the same time. Now, when you're dealing with bulls, the key thing there is recognise that they're comfortable leading. So if you give a bull a sense of responsibility or some task to do that you need doing, uh, it's likely that they will rise to the occasion and be happy to do that. And in fact, um, they will be very happy to do that. Uh, because they like being in charge, they like that responsibility. But what's important is for you to insist on two-way communication. And what I mean by that is, um, what I mean by two-way communication is that it's important for you to, um, often what happens when you're faced with a bull, a very powerful bull, is there's a tendency to take a step back. You know, you're thinking that they want some room. And of course, what they do is they tend to take a step forward. So they put you into a difficult position. And But the interesting thing about that is that the bull is not actually trying to take over a control freak. What's actually happening is that they can see a vacuum. So perhaps you're not making a decision or you're stepping back out of the um, arena they will jump in because they believe somebody's got to get in and get the job done. And that's their, that's why they do it. So it's quite an honourable intent, although being on the receiving end of it, you can assume that it's about them trying to take over. So just, so what that means is that you need to be very firm with the bull. Let them know where they stand. 
you know, commit to the agreements that you've made, remind them of the agreements that you've made. And by doing that, you'll get a better result. But they're not actually out to hurt you. They're not into that. They're not into small talk. They're not interested in all of that sort of stuff. And so they want to get down to business. As you saw earlier from the chart, it's very much a task focused personality. So they want to get on and get the task done. Um, be firm and to the point. And of course, if you do that, the bull actually sees a mirror image of themselves and they assume that you are just like them. And of course, that's a good thing in their mind. And so you find you get a little more responsiveness from them as such. Recognize that they're not noted for their outward displays of compassion. So don't wait and expect it. That's not likely to happen because you, if you rationalize it, uh, the bull, if they start, you know, wearing their heart on their sleeve, they put themselves in potentially a vulnerable position and being in a vulnerable position, they may well be taken advantage of by other people. So therefore the bull doesn't do that. They play their cards close to their chest. Now the owl as a personality, uh, know that they can be easily hurt, as I mentioned. So be careful that people who are of this predisp predisposition will take your word literally. So if you say something, they will analyze it in their own mind, uh, often later and really think about it in a big way. So be careful what you say, because people, this personality at least will hold you hold that against you. Recognize that they have a mindset that's programmed towards assessing risk. And you can use this very effectively by asking an owl, what do you see as the key risk indicators here in this project? They'll already have worked it out and you'll be quite amazed at what they'll come up with. So try and use them in those, in those risk type activities as such. Um, be prepared to answer their questions and uh, they don't like the whole, qu you know, they, don't, they want to know the answers because they're perfectionists. So it's important that you be able to feel comfortable answering questions of the owl because that'll make them feel secure because they've got answers so that they can get a better result knowing what all the information is, the full picture if you like. Um, try to keep a reasonable schedule. They certainly don't appreciate it if you are late or sloppy or forget. Uh, they do expect you to keep to schedule. And uh, it's like in this lunch and learn, um, the owl, if I went on for say, you know, another half an hour and we're supposed to be finishing in the next few minutes, 10 minutes, uh, they would probably be quite annoyed about that. And they wouldn't want to switch off though, because they might miss something, but they'd certainly be miffed about going over time. So recognize that your arguments and opinions absolutely have to be backed up with substance. It's very important. You can't just spruik. You need to be very crystal clear of your facts and be able to present it as such. Now the final personality is the lamb and they're the best advice that I can give you there when you're dealing with a lamb is to recognize that they need to be clear about the direction you're heading. So they need to be absolutely, they're not natural goal setters. So they need you to give them a very clear target to aim at. You need to be very, very clear about what you're trying to achieve. And once the lamb understands what they have to achieve, uh, they'll often go to work to get that done. But the first step is to give them some clarity around that. I think you also need to recognize that um, you try to get try to get them to agree upon targets with you. So get their commitment, if you like. You might recall in the very first module, I asked you to ask people to, for their commitment. The lambs is a, are a good, a good target for that. Ask the lambs, can I get your commitment on this? OK, which is very important. Um, don't always expect outward signs of enthusiasm from the lamb, because if you um, then, you know, they don't wear their heart on their sleeve, doesn't necessarily mean they're not motivated, but don't expect to see evidence or signs of that. 
it, they're very private people by nature. And I think the other thing that's important to understand about the lamb is when they quietly, uh, when they put things off, like they put things in a too hard basket or that kind of thing, what they're actually doing is it's their quiet form of control. So instead of saying no to you, they just don't do it. Uh, whereas the bull, if you give them something to do and they don't want to do it, they just say no. Whereas the lamb won't do that because that will create conflict. So what they will tend to do is just put it off and not do it. Um, and hopefully, you know, that's their way of maintaining some sense of control in the circumstances. So again, look for mutual commitment and try to get them to commit by doing that. Of course, they won't want to go back on their commitment because that, of course, could create a confrontation and that is not what the lamb really wants. So look for mutual commitments will work really well for you. So folks, have you, are there any questions that anyone has got? Any comments, any observations? Now's your chance. You can type in in the question box over there. I'm the only one, of course, as you know, that gets to see that. And I will certainly do what I can to answer it. Okay, nothing really? Okay, I'm sure you've been exposed to these sorts of things before. But I, I honestly believe that this is one of the most important things that I've ever learned because le learning to deal with people um, is really important because as a leader, um, you, you've got all these different types of people to deal with. And I don't want anyone to think that this is about you being phony or anything like that. It's not that at all. In actual fact, you're still being yourself. You're just accentuating parts of your personality that perhaps haven't been exercised for a while. Um, so that's all it is. And then if you do it that way, you will, um, you know, you'll get better results with people. And it's based on the golden rule. Now, the golden rule is treat people how you want to be treated, right? Now, we've all heard that rule. We've all been brought up in some way with that rule. There's nothing wrong with that rule. But in terms of dealing with personalities, I would think there's a better rule, and that's the platinum rule. And the platinum rule simply says treat people how they want to be treated. And so, in other words, if you treat people how they want to be treated, you'll get a much better result. So in other words, first thing is work out what the personality types are. Second thing is then treat them according to that and you'll find that you'll get this incredibly strong rapport that perhaps wasn't there before. Um, you're most welcome to, um, to print those uh, questionnaires off and to do them with your team and have a bit of a bit of fun with it. I'm more than happy for you to do that. So don't feel, um, don't feel as if you can't do that. It's all part of the fee that you pay for the Lunch and Learn series. So folks, that's pretty much it. You're being very quiet today, which is fine. Um, no questions really by the look of it. All right, look, we'll finish there. Uh, I think I just wanted to sort of give you a little bit of homework to do, which I normally do. I'd like you to, to try and approach people you lead with an emphasis on their personality type. So I'd like you to actually have a go at this, uh, to be more aware of it and to try this and to start this afternoon and just see how it works for you. I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised once you have uh, started to accentuate that part of the personality, which is part of the other person's predisposition, you'll get a great result out of that, I'm sure. So folks, that's it from me. And then next time we meet our last session, our very last session will be uh, on facilitating effective meetings in two weeks. So I'm looking forward to uh, working with you on that. So that's about it from me. Have a wonderful weekend, won't you? Um, have fun with the personality profiles and uh, we'll catch up again uh, in two weeks time and so have a fantastic weekend. Thank you and goodbye.